Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the St. Thomas More and the Golden Junior Center. A special welcome to all who might be visiting tonight for the first time. When you think of Jesuits, other than Pope Francis, Father James Martin is probably one of the most well-known. Whether it's due to his antics on the Colbert Report, his commentary as a guest on PBS NewsHour or The O'Reilly Factor, his social media presence, his books on almost everything Jesuit, on prayer, on the saints, on life in general, he is a well-known and respected contemporary Catholic voice. Father Jim currently serves as editor-at-large at America Magazine, which recently celebrated its 109th anniversary of publication. Today, I'm happy to welcome Father Jim to do what he does best, address a serious challenge for the church today as he talks about the topic, Building a Bridge, Welcoming LGBT Catholics. Thank you so much. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Uh, you know the story of the priest who gets up to the microphone and blows on it and taps on it and says, I think there's something wrong with this thing. And the crowd says, and also with you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I am, oh, you know what? Can we have the screen down, please? That's doable. Um, oh, poor Jen has to do everything. Uh, I want to thank her for her welcome. Uh, and also I want to thank uh, the whole St. Thomas More Center. I really feel at home here. I think this is my third time, uh, even though I went to Penn, sorry. Uh, I know, yeah, sad. Um, I feel very much at home here. So, um, I want to talk tonight um, about uh, building a bridge between the LGBT Catholic community and the Catholic Church in the US. Now that relationship uh, between the institutional church and the LGBT community has been at times contentious and combative and at times warm and welcoming. Much of the tension in this complicated relationship results from a lack of communication and a good deal of mistrust between LGBT Catholics and the hierarchy. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Ooh. Hold on. Oh, there we go. There we go. Hold on. Uh. Try again. There we go. So there's a lot of mistrust between what I would call the institutional church and the LGBT community. And what do I mean by the institutional church? Uh, I mean not only uh, the Pope and the Vatican and the hierarchy uh, and bishops and priests, but also lay leaders in the church who can make decisions, right? So I consider in the institutional church the lay leader of a Catholic high school, right? The lay president uh, of a Catholic university. Why? Because that person can make decisions about hiring and firing, for example, that affects the lives of LGBT people. So for purposes of this discussion, uh, the institutional church are the decision makers in the Catholic Church. And I, the, 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 I'd like to invite you to think about a bridge between those two groups, between LGBT Catholics and the decision makers in the church. The Catechism invites us to treat LGBT people, what they call homosexual persons, with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Now, what might that mean? And what might it mean for the LGBT community to treat the institutional church with those same virtues? In this, in this talk, I'd like to take a walk on the first lane of that bridge from the institutional church to LGBT Catholics. Okay, there's another lane from the LGBT group uh, to the institutional church, but I'll leave you to read about that in my book, Building a Bridge, which makes the perfect gift for your friends and family. Um, <laughs> So what does respect mean? Well, first of all, respect means, at the very, very least, recognizing that the LGBT community exists in the Catholic Church. OK? They're there by virtue of their baptism. That's a group of them at the Church of St. Paul the Apostle in New York, which has a flourishing LGBT ministry. And extending to them the recognition that any group deserves because of their presence among us. In 2016, after the mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub uh, in Orlando, Florida, while some bishops, Catholic bishops, expressed their support for the LGBT community, 
Uh, most did not. And of the few who did, uh, fewer still even mentioned the words LGBT or gay, right? This revealed a failure to acknowledge the existence of these people. Even in death, these people were invisible to many Catholic leaders. But this is not a Christian model because Jesus recognizes all people. He reaches out specifically to those people on the margins. Catholics, therefore, have a responsibility to make everyone feel both visible and valuable. Recognizing that LGBT Catholics exist has important pastoral implications. It means carrying out ministries that some dioceses and schools and parishes do very well. Examples include celebrating masses with LGBT groups, you know, for example, like the Thomas More Center having outreach programs for LGBT people, sponsoring diocesan and parish outreach programs, and in general, helping LGBT Catholics feel that they are part of the church, that they are welcomed and they are loved. Some Catholics object to this, which is kind of an understatement. Um, <laughs> let's go online. Uh, and they say that any outreach implies a tacit approval with anything that any LGBT person has ever said or done. But this is a wholly unfair objection. Why? Because it's done with no other group. Imagine if a parish or a diocese sponsored an outreach program for, say, Catholic business leaders, right? People wouldn't say, oh my gosh, you know, what about Catholic social teaching? And what about Laudato Si? And are you paying fair wages? They don't say that. Why not? Because people recognize that a parish or diocese is trying to help a particular group feel more connected to the church, the church that they belong to by virtue of their baptism. Second, respect means calling a group what it asks to be called. On a personal level, like my, some of my family members call me Jimmy, right, from way back when. Uh, if um, I introduced you to myself as Jim and you kept calling me Jimmy, people around you might think, well, that's a little rude, right? People have a right to the name that they want to be called by, right? It's just common courtesy. That's the same on a group level, too. We don't say Negroes any longer. Why not? Because that group feels more comfortable with other names like African American and Blacks. A few years ago, I was told that disabled persons is not as acceptable as people with disabilities. So now I use the latter term. Why? It's respectful to call people by the name they wish to be called by. This is not some minor concern. In the Jew as you know, you know, since we're at YDS, in the Jewish and Christian traditions, names are important. A name in the Hebrew scriptures stands for a person's identity, right? Knowing a person's name meant in a sense that you knew that person, that you had a certain intimacy with that person, even that you have a kind of power over that person, right? That's why there's so much emphasis on, you know, I won't let you go until you tell me your name, right? It's kind of knowledge. That's one reason why when Moses asks God what God's name is, what does God say? Right, but hopefully with more passion than that, you know. <laughs> what is your name? Who shall I say sent me? I am who I am. It's like, wow, God, you seem kind of sort of low energy today. I am who I am, which uh, our um, Old Testament professor at Weston said basically means none of your business, right? <laughs> That's what that means. You know, God's name is for God's self, right? It's, it's, it's holy. It's, it's not for Moses to know. In the New Testament, Jesus renamed Simon as Peter, and the former persecutor Saul renames himself as Paul, right? Names are important. The very first question that a priest or deacon asks parents at an infant baptism is, what name do you give this child? That's the first thing out of the priest's mouth. What name do you give this child? Because names are important, church leaders are invited to be attentive to how they name the LGBT community. So let us finally lay to rest phrases like afflicted with same-sex attraction. All right? You know, you laugh, people laugh, but that, that, is, that is the common phrase uh, uh, on, on, I would say, very conservative blogs and magazines. I did an interview with a very conservative magazine, and I made this point. And then the next paragraph, they said, when Father Martin speaks about people with same-sex attraction, you know, he uses LGBT. So it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of kind of embedded, but we need to set that aside because that is not what this group of people calls themselves, right? Even homosexual people sounds overly clinical. I'm not saying what name to use, right? There are many names, LGBT, queer, LGBTQ, right? I mean, there's many names. 
I'm just saying that the Catholic Church needs to listen to what people name themselves. Respect also means acknowledging that LGBT Catholics bring unique gifts to the church, both as individuals and as communities. These gifts build up the church in special ways, as St. Paul wrote when he compared the people of God to a human body, right? We need the eye, the foot, the hand. By the way, that's from a group called Ignatian Q. It was a, uh, a meeting at Loyola, um, Loyola, Maryland, Loyola University of Maryland in Baltimore um, of all the LGBT groups of the 28 Jesuit colleges and universities, um, which I attended. So every one of those people in that group has a gift and has multiple gifts that they bring to the church, right, as individuals, but also as a community. And one of the things I like to invite people to think about as we meditate on how LGBT people build up the church is what might those gifts be, right? You know, it's, all, it's wrong to generalize, but I think to, to look at a group that has been marginalized and treated so poorly for so long, it's good to generalize in a positive way. So have you ever thought about what gifts do LGBT Catholics bring to the church? Well, many LGBT people have endured from an early age misunderstanding, prejudice, hatred, even violence. And so in my experience, they often feel a natural compassion for people on the margins, right? That compassion is a gift, right? Can we doubt that compassion is a gift that's brought to the church? They have often been made to feel unwelcome in their parishes and in their churches. Uh, since this book came out um, in um, uh, June, I've been do doing a lot of talks, but I've also been getting uh, tons of messages through social media and and phone calls and, and snail mail letters from people who talk about their difficult experiences with the church, right? I had a, um, I had a woman uh, a couple months ago tell me that, she said, do you know any uh, compassionate priests in our diocese? She was a hospice chaplain. She was a hospice worker, and the priest assigned to her hospice was refusing to anoint a man who was dying because he was gay. Yeah, right. I had another man, very poignant, uh, called me up. He's 30 years old and he's autistic. And he had just come out to his family. And his lo he's not in a relationship. I want to underline that to sort of help you understand the story. His parish priest said he could no longer receive communion in the church because he was a scandal, right? And he was calling me. He said, maybe you could receive communion in the rectory from time to time. Yeah. So these, and he wanted to know what to do. So these people persevere. They have great faith. And I think it takes more faith to be in the church as an LGBT person than as a straight person because of the stuff you have to put up with. So their perseverance is a faith. Finally, they are forgiving of clergy who treat them like damaged goods. Endlessly forgiving. Forgiveness is the gift. Compassion, perseverance, forgiveness are things that the community, in addition to their individual gifts, brings to the church. Seeing, naming, and honoring all these gifts are components of respecting our LGBT brothers and sisters and siblings, right? Respect, that's in the catechism. So is accepting them as beloved children of God and letting them know that they are beloved children of God. The church has a call to proclaim God's love for a people who are often made to feel whether by their families, neighbors, or religious leaders, as though they were damaged goods, unworthy of ministry, and even subhuman. The Catholic Church is invited to both proclaim and demonstrate that LGBT people are beloved children of God. Respect should also be extended to the workplace, especially if that workplace is a church or church-related organization. To that end, I am very concerned, like many people, with the recent trend of firing of LGBT men and women. I'm gonna show a few faces just to put faces to the names. Now, church organizations have the authority to require their employees to follow church teachings. That makes sense, right? I mean, if I worked for the Archdiocese of Hartford, right, and I did something that was against their, their rules, they would say, Father Jim, please don't do that. If I worked for Jen here at St. Thomas More Center and I decided I wanted to steal some of those nice chandeliers from the church, you know, from my room, she would say, we don't do that here, you know? 
So, you know, when you work for an organization, you have to follow its rules, and part of that is church teaching, right? If I went out and I, you know, stabbed someone in the back, right, they might not be surprised because I'm a Jesuit, but um, <laughs> they would say, we don't do that here, right? The problem is that these, the, the authority is applied in a very highly selective way. Almost all of the firings in recent years have focused on LGBT matters. There's a couple, one of whom was fired after she got married, after that picture appeared on Facebook. Specifically, these firings have related to those employees who have been entered into same-sex marriages, which is against church teaching, and where one or the other partner has a public, public role in the church. But if adherence to church teaching is going to be a litmus test for employment in Catholic institutions, then dioceses and parishes and schools need to be consistent. Right? If adherence to church teaching is the litmus test for your employment in a Catholic institution, then it needs to be applied consistently. Therefore, we should fire straight people who are divorced and remarried without an annulment. That is against church teaching. We should fire women who bear children out of wedlock and men who father children out of wedlock. They should be fired because that is against church teaching. We should fire, and this is a huge category, men and women living together before being married. They should be fired because that is against church teaching. We should fire everyone who practices birth control, also against church teaching, right? These actions are all against church teaching. Why do we not fire these people? I'm glad you're laughing because it is risible. Why do we not fire these people? Because we're being selective about which church teachings matter and who has them applied to their situation. And what about church, church employees who are not Catholic, right? If you follow the logic, if we fire employees who do not ad agree with or adhere to church teaching, we should fire all Protestants who work in Catholic institutions, right? Because they do not believe in papal authority. We should fire Unitarians who don't believe in the Trinity. We should fire agnostics and atheists. But we don't fire these people. Here's another way of looking at this kind of selectivity, one that shows why it is especially problematic. Requiring church employees to adhere to church teaching means at a much more fundamental level adhering to the gospel. So we should fire people who are not forgiving. We should fire people who do not care for the poor. We should fire people who are cruel. Now, I, I put this out of my book in June, and I had a bishop online in his column say that that's totally different than same-sex marriage, you know, firing people who are cruel because that's not a public scandal. Now, if a person who is cruel and unforgiving working for a Catholic institution is not a public scandal, I don't know what is. The selectivity of focus on LGBT matters and LGBT people and their sexuality and their sexual morality when it comes to firings is to use the words of the Catholic Catechism, a sign of unjust discrimination, something we are to avoid. It's discriminatory. It's targeting people for the simple reason that they are gay or lesbian or transgender. So all that's part of respect, listening to people, respecting their gifts, understanding that they're here, right? Treating them with dignity and not being discriminatory. So respect. What about compassion? Respect, compassion, sensitivity. What would it mean for the, for the institutional church to show compassion to LGBT men and women? Now, the word compassion, as you know, since you're all at Yale, um, Pasco is the Greek, to suffer or experience, right? Compassion, so it's to suffer with or experience with. What does it mean for, what would it mean for the church to experience life with LGBT people and even to suffer with them? Well, the first and most essential requirement is listening, listening. It's impossible to experience a person's life or be compassionate if you don't listen to the person or ask questions. Imagine you come up to me and you say, Jim, I'm really going through a hard time. I, I need a little compassion. I'll say, that's OK. I don't need to hear it. I'll just exude compassion. You know, I'll just stand here and be compassionate. It's insane. But the church has generally not listened to LGBT people. Questions that Catholic leaders might ask their LGBT friends are, what was it like growing up as a gay boy? What was that like? 
What was it like growing up as a girl who found out she was attracted to other girls? And here's a really important question. What is it like being a transgender person? What is that like? What's your experience of God? How is your understanding of Jesus influenced by your sexuality or your identity? Where do you experience joy in your life? What do you hope for? You need to listen. We also might ask parents and family members of LGBT Catholics these questions, because here's something that may not be a surprise to you. Since this book came out and I started to do these conversations, ministry to LGBT Catholic is ministry to a much larger group. Right here, I often use this example because it happened here about a year ago. I was giving a talk on Jesus, right, specifically on a book I wrote called Jesus a Pilgrimage, which also makes the perfect gift for your friends and family. Um, <laughs> and afterwards, a woman came up to me uh, in, I guess out there in the book signing, and she it was about Jesus. I wasn't speaking specifically about LGBT stuff. And she leaned over, and the, the, the book had been announced that was, it was coming out, and people were asking questions. And she leaned over, and she said, Father, I want to tell you something. And I thought she was going to say, I'd been on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, or this is my favorite gospel passage. You know what she said? Probably 80, white hair. My grandchild is transgender, and I love, I love my, chi- my grandchild so much, and I just want for them to be part of the church. And I realize ministry to LGBT people is ministry to her, to the whole family. So how can we listen to her? What's your life been like now? How has this changed your understanding of God and the church? How has the church been helpful for you or unhelpful? So ministry to LGBT people is increasingly ministry to the whole church, as more and more people are public about their identity. For the church to exercise compassion, we need to listen. And when we listen, we will hear the calls for help and prayer. When our LGBT brothers and sisters are persecuted, church leaders are called to stand with them. You know, in many parts of the world, in 70 countries, it is illegal to be gay or lesbian. In something like 13 countries, you can be executed. So guess what? It's a life issue for the church. It is a pro-life issue in many of these countries. In these countries, the institutional church has an absolute moral duty to stand up for its persecuted brothers and sisters publicly. Now, sadly, that doesn't happen very often. And in fact, some church leaders have supported some of these discriminatory laws. But standing up for someone who is being persecuted or beaten is surely part of church teaching. If you doubt that, read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Whoops. Closer to home, what would it mean for the church in our country to say, when needed, it is wrong to treat LGBT people like this? Now, Catholic leaders regularly publish statements, as they should, defending the unborn, refugees and migrants, the poor, the homeless, the aged, as they should. The bishops in this this country have been tremendous about refugees and migrants, tremendous. And they've taken heat for it, right? That's one way to stand with people, compassion, right? To suffer with them is to take heat for them, putting yourself out there. But where are the statements in support of our LGBT brothers and sisters? Public statements of support. When I ask this, some people say, well, you can't compare what a refugee faces with what an LGBT person faces. And as someone who worked with refugees in East Africa for two years, I know that's often the case. But it is important not to ignore the disproportionately high rates of suicide among LGBT people. LGBT youths are five times more likely to commit the, to, to attempt suicide. Or the, the, the fact that LGBT people are propor- victims of proportionally more hate crimes than any other minority group in the country. These are life issues, remember? Life issues. Now, as I mentioned before, in the wake of the massacres at Pulse nightclub, 49 people, when the LGBT community across the country was grieving, I was myself grieved that more bishops did not signal their support. A few did, and were very strong about it. Most did not. But contrast that to when the shootings are like in Parkland, right? Or in the Methodist, remember the Methodist church in in Texas? The bishops come out immediately, as they should, with expressions of support. We are with you in prayer, right? We We are with you. Bishops 
They'll have, um, you know, interfaith or inter, uh, ecumenical services, as they should. Why didn't more Catholic leaders name, treat these people with dignity? To me, it was a failure of compassion, a failure to experience with, a failure to be willing to suffer with. You know, uh, when I was at um, theology school at Weston, now um, BC, um, I had a moral theology professor, you may know, Jim Keenan, Father James Keenan, who's a Jesuit. And he pointed out that in the Gospels, when Jesus identifies sin, it's not where people are weak and trying, you know, people are really struggling. It's where people are strong and not bothering. So you think about Lazarus and Dives, right? The rich man who just steps over the poor guy on his doorstep. Or the good Samaritan where the priest and the Levite just pass by, right? His definition of sin for Jesus, Father Kenyon's, was a failure to bother to love. So in Orlando, we just didn't bother. So we have to reflect on this sinfulness in the church, this failure to bother to love our brothers and sisters. We need not look far from a model in, the, in this. God did this for all of us in Jesus. The opening lines of the Gospel of John say, the word became flesh and lived among us. As you know, a better translation is the word became flesh and encamped with us or pitched his tent, right, with us. This is what Jesus did, lived alongside us, took our side, right? Took on our humanity, even died like us. This is what the church is called to do with all marginalized groups, as Pope Francis has reminded us repeatedly, including with LGBT Catholics, to experience their lives with them and to suffer with them. And to be joyful with them, too. You know, actually, I gave this um, uh, book in manuscript form to a graduate from uh, YDS who's a gay man. And he said, oh, it's all about suffering. You know, we do have good times sometimes, Jim. <laughs> so it's to be joyful with them, too, because Jesus came to experience all parts of our lives, not just the sorrowful parts. Can we rejoice with our LGBT brothers and sisters? Can we celebrate their gifts, what they bring, and them? Can we celebrate and treasure them? That is a kind of compassion, too, to share in the Christian joy that LGBT men and women bring to the church. So all that's about compassion, experiencing with and suffering with, and being joyful with. Finally, sensitivity. How can the institutional church be sensitive towards LGBT people? Uh, my old dictionary describes sensitivity as an awareness or understanding of the feelings of other people. By the way, that's a family I met at a book signing at St. Francis Xavier Church. Isn't that a great picture? Just, I love that picture. The young man in the middle is gay, and those are his parents and his sister. It's a beautiful picture. This, this, uh, this desire to understand and be aware of the feelings of other people is related to Pope Francis's call to be a church of accompaniment and encounter. Those are two words he likes a lot. To begin with, it is impossible to know another person's feeling at a distance. You cannot understand the feelings of the LGBT community if all you do is issue documents about them, preach about them, or tweet about them without knowing them. I mean, imagine I'm going to do a paper or an article about Vietnamese Catholics, but I actually don't talk to them or know any of them. That's okay, I don't need to. I mean, it's insane, right? But this is what the church often does with LGBT people, sort of speaks at them. One reason I think the institutional church has struggled with this sensitivity, is that many church leaders do not know many people who are LGBT, right, and public about it. So what's needed is dialogue and encounter. A friend of mine who said he could, I could use his name, my friend Brian, uh, is a gay man who worked for a bishop, not near here in this diocese, in the United States, as his social justice person. So you know, like in different chanceries, they'll have like a person who is responsible for Hispanic Catholics or, you know, the aged or, well, he was the bishop's social justice guy. And Brian and the bishop would take these car rides together to different parishes and diocesan meetings and whatnot. And while they were in the car, the bishop would make homophobic comments to the person who was doing work for him and who he admired. And I said to Brian, why don't you come out to the guy? And he says, are you kidding? He's the last person I would come out to. So the bishop was sort of denied the opportunity, thanks to his homophobia, from getting to know someone who's gay, right? Coming to know people, that changes everything. In 2015, Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn, 
The Archbishop of Vienna reminded us of this at the meeting of the Synod of Bishops on the Family. Remember that two-year meeting that took place? Around that time, Cardinal Schoenborn spoke of a gay couple he knew who had transformed his understanding of LGBT people. He, often, he also offered some qualified praise for same-sex unions. This is the Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna. This is to show you that things are not the same everywhere in the church. Quote, one shares one's life. One shares the joys and suffering. One helps one another. We must recognize that this person has made an important step for his own good and for the good of others. Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna. He also, get this, overruled a priest in his archdiocese who had prohibited a man in a same-sex union from serving on the parish council. Did you get that? He overruled the pastor who removed the man who was in a same-sex union. He stood with his LGBT brother. Much of this came from his own experience and knowledge and friendship with LGBT people. Cardinal Schoenborn said of the church, it must accompany people. And there's someone in this audience now who I know is having a dialogue with his bishop, right? His son is gay, and he's having a dialogue with a local bishop, right? And they're, they've, they're, they're sort of coming to understand each other. So it's about knowing and understanding and encountering. In all these things, Jesus, as in all things, is our model. When Jesus encountered people on the margins, he saw not categories but individuals. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that the LGBT community should be or should feel marginalized. Rather, I am saying that within the church, many of them do find themselves marginalized. They are seen as the other, right? Or the scapegoat, you know, like Rene Girard and, and his work, the other, the scapegoat. It's us and them. But for Jesus, there is no us and them. There's just us. And by way of conclusion, I want to invite you to meditate on two gospel stories. The first is the, I think I have it here, oops, yeah, the story of the Roman centurion, played by Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> this is, for those of us who are old enough to remember, that's Franco Zeffirelli's 1978, Jesus of Nazareth, which I highly recommend. And honest to God, whenever I meditate on this story, I see Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> But isn't that, a, isn't that a great picture? That is a, I just, I adore that picture and I love the two of them. So in, in the Gospels, uh, so as you know, let's set up the story. Jesus is in Capernaum. Capernaum is a seaside town of about 1,500 to 2,000 people, right? You can go see, I was just there a few weeks ago. You can go see the ruins. It's still there. By the way, as an aside, Capernaum where Jesus spent three years of his ministry, it was his base of ministry in Galilee, and where all these miracles happened, like the, the, the demon coming out of the, the man with the unclean spirit in the synagogue and him healing um, Peter's mother-in-law, right? And he's living there, and he's doing these miracles and calls Matthew there, and the woman with the hemorrhage happened right around there. We, we, we tend to think of Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nazareth. We forget about Capernaum as this really important part of Jesus' life. So a digression. Uh, a few years ago, they were excavating the ruins of Capernaum. And they came upon a house. It's a Jewish town, right? Jewish fishermen, basically, and their families that had a Roman bath in it. And I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why would a, why would a house in Capernaum have a Roman bath? Who could have a, oh. And they realized they were standing in the house of the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion who says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. They were standing in the house that we mention every day at Mass. So these are real people, right? So the story in Capernaum is Jesus is there, and the Roman centurion comes up to him and says, my servant is sick. And Jesus says, I will come to your house. And he says, as we quote, Lord, I'm not worthy. He says, you know, I too am a man with people under authority. I say to one go and he goes. I say to another, do this and he does it. And Jesus is amazed. The gospels say he's surprised. He's amazed by the man's faith and says, never have I seen faith like this in all of Israel. And he heals the man's servant. Right? Now what's the point? He's a pagan. He is completely outside of the Jewish milieu. He, he may have some power. We know that he built the synagogue in Capernaum, the ruins of which you can still see. But he's not Jewish. Jesus did not say, pagan, sinner, 
go become Jewish and I'll talk to you, right? Go get circumcised and maybe we can talk, right? He doesn't. Look how Jesus treats someone who is on the margins. He listens to him. He encounters him. He treats him with great respect, and then he does this great act of love for him. This is how we're called to treat people on the margins in our church, the way Jesus did. And then finally, my favorite story, Zacchaeus. Isn't that beautiful? That's James Tissot. Um, so I want to set up the story of Zacchaeus, and I would like you, my brothers and sisters, to see, or I'd invite you to think of Zacchaeus as an emblem of the LGBT person. Now, it is not a perfect correspondence. It is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Some of the parts are going to fail a little bit. But I want you to think of him as the, LGBT, as the emblem of the LGBT community. And that's actually a good thing to look at. So, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is going through Jericho, which is a huge town, right? The, the oldest continually inhabited town in the world. It's still there. So, tens of thousands of people. It's towards the end of his ministry. He's on his way to Jerusalem. So, Jesus, by this point, would have had a considerable crowd following him, right? Now, we know there's the 12, right? They were probably with him. The disciples, how many are they? Maybe 72. The followers, a little bigger, maybe. So maybe reasonable to say 100 people in this crowd trailing him. He's going through a huge city. He's well known as the wonder worker. And who is in the city? Zacchaeus, who is described as short in stature, right? He is the chief tax collector in the region. At the time, that would have meant the chief sinner in the region because of his collusion with the Roman authorities, right? So probably one of those marginalized people. People probably hated him. I'd like you to, to think about Zacchaeus as an emblem of the LGBT person, not because of sinfulness, because we're all sinners, right? But because this is the person who would have felt the most marginalized from the rest of the community. Jesus comes through the city. The gospel says that Zacchaeus could not see Jesus, quote, on account of the crowd. How often does the crowd get in between the LGBT person and an encounter with Christ? How often does the crowd prevent someone in the margins from encountering Jesus? How often are we in the crowd? So what does he do? He climbs a tree. He climbs a sycamore tree. It's a beautiful little detail in the Gospels that remind us. By the way, Scripture scholars tell us that when we know the names of people, these are people that would have been known to the early church, right? It's not just a man born blind or you know, a leper or the one with the hemorrhage. It's Bartimaeus, Zacchaeus, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. These are real people. He climbs a sycamore tree. By the way, I was just there about a month ago. There's a sycamore tree called, inevitably, the Zacchaeus tree in the middle of uh, Jericho. And uh, we were going by in our tour bus, and we stopped and read the reading. And someone said, Father Jim, is that the tree? I was like, hmm. <laughs> they said, it looks 2,000 years old. And I said, yeah, but if it was 2,000 years old, it would have been this big when Zacchaeus had to climb up it, you know? <laughs> so anyways, Zacchaeus climbs the tree. And you know what the gospel says? Do you know why he climbs the tree? Because he wanted to see who Jesus was. Isn't that beautiful? That's what LGBT people want. That's what they want to see who Jesus is. He literally has to go out on a limb. Think of all the stories that I was just telling about the autistic man or people who are fired, what they have to go through just to encounter Jesus, the lengths that they have to go through. It's a very undignified thing to do back at that time, too. So Jesus is passing through Jericho surrounded by hundreds of people and a crowds of probably thousands of people. Who does he call to? The religious authorities? Someone who's seen as, you know, moral? No, you. Look at him, you. Hurry down, Zacchaeus, for I must stay at your house tonight. He's offering him welcome. And then my favorite line in this whole gospel story, quote, 
and all who heard it began to grumble. <laughs> Just go online. That's what people are doing today. They're grumbling. The extension of mercy to someone on the margins always angers people. And by the way, all began to grumble. That in Panza, I think. That seems to include the disciples, too. All who saw it began to grumble. Zagius comes down from the tree, and the, the, the gospel says he stood there. But the Greek is stathes. He stood his ground, right? Like LGBT people have to do in the church. He stood there. Imagine all the people jeering at him. And he said, I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and anyone I have defrauded I will repay four times over. An encounter with Jesus produces a conversion. And I don't mean conversion therapy, right? which someone suggested once when I was doing this story. I mean metanoia, right? The change of mind and hearts that all of us are called to. All of us are called to. Metanoia, which is what Jesus calls for. He's converted thanks to his encounter with Jesus. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. This, the, uh, the Old Testament scholar Ben Myers said that for John the Baptist, it was... Conversion first, community second, right? Think about that. Like, convert, repent, and then you're part of the community. For Jesus, it's community first, conversion second. Community, welcome, outreach, respect, compassion, sensitivity. Welcome. That's how we are to treat people who feel like they're on the margins. So when it comes to LGBT people in the church, to me, it seems like there are two places to stand. You can stand with the crowd who grumbles over the extension of mercy, or you can stand with Jesus. For me, I choose to stand with Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you for helping us to begin with walking across the bridge. We do have some time for some questions, so if you would kindly line up behind the microphone and keep your questions brief, Father Jim will answer some for us. Um, thank you, Father. I think it's, it's very important to present Jesus to, to our society, to everyone, and especially with terms that are understandable. So I, I wanted to ask you one thing that I have been struggling uh, with, which is how to communicate the, the treasures of the faith, in particular understanding of human nature. Because and even there was a professor from Harvard, I know it's not such a great place, but he actually didn't realize. And where is that again? I'm sorry. Yeah. That's right. yes. I think like New Hampshire or yes. North. Uh, <laughs> so he, he actually didn't realize that the idea of the fallen nature, the, the Catholic position existed. He just thought that Augustine, you either had to have like a completely depraved nature or the, the current dominant understanding, which is a completely good nature with no flaw. So I, I did my best to try to explain to them, well, it, the, the broken understanding, each and every one of us is broken. Like a mirror, we still reflect God, but there is a part of us that is not who we are, but he's always with us until the second coming and hopefully uh, reincarnation. Uh, so how can we explain that distinction of the two parts that are part of our human nature. Because if, if you have heard about the objectivist, they basically take this and just run with it. They just say, look, look, we're egoistic, which is true. Most of us are broken that way. And he says, and therefore it's part of our nature, therefore we shall embrace it and go for it. So how can we respond to those types of arguments in which our nature, it doesn't distinguish between these two parts of our nature, and how can we present them more than just like go and read the catechism? Like, how can we show the beauty of the, the Catholic teaching in which part of who we are? And it's, it's, 
it's our cross, it's what will sanctify us, but it's still not who we are in the deepest sense of the being. So how can we accurately present human nature as both sinful and loved, is that right? No, as fallen, because that's the fallen. problem. Like the sin still requires, so it has to right. be original sin rather than vice. Sure. Because if it's vice, it's chosen, and right. it, this is something that is not chosen. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm no theologian and may not be able to respond to that question adequately, but I would say, um, uh, in the, you know, the old joke that original sin is the only totally provable theological proposition. Right? <laughs> I mean, you just have to look within yourself or look around. Uh, in an interview with uh, American Magazine in 2013, Pope Francis was asked, who are you? Who is Jorge Mario Bergoglio? And he said, I'm a sinner loved by God. Yeah. Now, the Jesuits, our way of looking at things is as a love sinner. And I think part of it is to start from experience. So people are, I think most sort of intelligent people are able to look at themselves and say, yeah, you know, I sin, I'm, I'm tempted to that. But I also feel, I also experience God's love. And so I think part of it is to help the individual, reflect. this is what I find helpful, help the individual reflect on both his or her or their own sinfulness, but also the way that God has blessed them and loved them. And eventually, they, they do come to understand themselves as, in that Jesuit phrase, the love sinner. So we, we are all sinners, but that's a... That's, so if you want the, the theological distinction between Mary and Joseph, neither of the two sinned, Joseph according to most uh, theologians, but Joseph was broken. Joseph had a fallen nature in a way that Mary didn't. So you, you, for you, both of them are the same category. I want to to show to them the idea that our nature has these two components, not just our choice, which sin is a choice, has these two components. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I gen in my experience, I generally find that people are not as, shall we say, confused about that, that most people are okay accepting that, and most people say I'm sinful. I mean, you sit in the confession or even spiritual direction or whatever, they'll admit it, you know, and they will also admit their, that, that God loves them. So I think actually for a lot of people, I think just starting with experience is, is the most helpful rather than the kind of theological categories. Thanks. Hello, Father Martin. Thank you for coming. Uh, Welcome. It's been a joy. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to say uh, that as a gay person from a very conservative place in Arizona, um, your, the beginning of how you start your book really resonated with me um, with the 2016 shooting. I was actually at Duke doing a summer program uh, when that happened, and um, I went to mass that Sunday, and the, the father there um, really centered his homily around it. And I was um, quite shocked, actually, um, and I've told family and friends this, um, because I just didn't think that that sort of thing was spoken about in the church, and it's not something that that, that I think would have been addressed um, where I'm from. So I have two questions. Sure. Uh, firstly, you speak about going to the margins, which I think uh, both Father Bob and Carl have done so beautifully here in, the, uh, in my time I've been here. Um, so within the LGBTQ community, um, perhaps those at the margins are those who don't identify with gender, non-gender binary. Um, so, and you often address in your book uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ uh, men and women. So what is their place within uh, the Catholic Church? And then secondly, um, I'm wondering what you think the place of those uh, queer people who are in relationships or married is within the church. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. I'm glad you had that experience at Duke. I mean, it is. And I think for me, the sad thing is that that's even notable. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is that we have to say that isn't it great that a priest would actually take note of the largest mass shooting in US history at that time. Um, all those people you mentioned, now I'm still learning about different categories and different individuals. Um, and, you know, for me, that the, the fundamental reality is baptism. So all those people that you described, you know, gender nonconforming, gender queer, uh, and even the way that people define themselves in those groups is different, right, from, from person to person. People in uh, same-sex relationships, people in same-sex marriages, right? They're all Catholic. If they're baptized, they're Catholic, period. They are just as much a part of the church as Pope Francis is, as, as a local bishop is, as I am, right? And one of the things I think that is important for us as Catholics to do is to, is to really hold on to that and to remind people of that because so many people tell them you're not part of the church. They're baptized. Jesus Christ himself calls you into the church at your baptism, right? Not only for your own personal sanctification, but also because the church needs you. So one of the things I tell people, and I, I think the struggle is, more often than not, it's people in those groups that come to me and say, I've left, and I, I, I really, 
want to listen to that and honor that and not say that's wrong or that's terrible. But I sometimes feel, and I sometimes say to them, you know, you're a Catholic, you know, why would you, in a sense, let someone, you know, some stupid priest who says something ridiculous to you, remove, you know, your, the sacramental grace of your baptism? So, so, so the, the, the answer to your question is, what part do they have in the church? As much part as I have in the church. And maybe more because of the way they've been treated. You know, Jesus goes out to specifically people who feel like they are marginalized. You know, he, he has a special attention to people on the margin. So those people may be more Catholic than I am. Thank Thanks. you, Father. Sure. Thank you. Hi, Father. Um, so I just wanted to ask a question about um, attraction and identity, right? Because this is about us, not about them. This is all of us, right? Mm -hmm. So we are all people with sinful temptations, right? So I experienced temptation to lie. I think 99% of the human population experiences temptation to masturbate. We experience temptation to steal, vandalize. Like we all experience these, these temptations. And so if I experience a temptation to engage in sexual behavior with a woman, I am by definition like attracted sexually to women, right? But that's not my identity, right? Like my identity is I'm a child of God and I'm, I'm experiencing that attraction, I'm experiencing that temptation. And we're all called to resist these temptations that, that God is calling us to, res to, to, to resist. So how would you make that distinction then between, between attraction and identity? And when you say LGBT Catholics, the huge distinction that I'm not hearing is, are these, right, yes, these are Catholics, these are us, this is us, right? But are these, like, are we, and they experience this, this attraction, and that needs to be treated with sensitivity, of course. But when you say LGBT Catholics, are you talking about the ones that are engaging in this or the ones that are resisting, right, and, and, and being chaste and true to the church, church teaching? So I'm thinking about organizations like Courage, which are all about reaching out to Catholics who experience same-sex attraction and helping them follow church teaching and live in chastity and celibacy. So how would you respond to sure. that? Sure. Well, so two questions. Um, you know, one is the... Temptation to engage in same-sex uh, relations, and the other would be, um, you know, as you're saying, uh, you know, where do LGBTQ Catholics fit, and and why would I use that terminology? Is that accurate? Is that the two questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the second question is, I use that terminology because they use the terminology, mm -hmm. and I think it's important that we listen. I would never call someone a Negro, if 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 he or she says, please don't call me that. I don't wish to be called by that. And when I say LGBT people, I'm talking about people who are simply born as uh, individuals with same-sex attraction. So, for example... Right. So the same you know, thing I'm talking about. Right. I beg your pardon? So the same thing I'm talking about with the, that label. Yeah. Right. I mean, for example, even if a person who is not uh, acting... Look, if you have a 14-year-old boy who is celibate, right? You know, he's in junior high school or whatever. He's gay, right? And he calls himself LGBT, and so I would call him LGBT. He doesn't have to be, act he doesn't have to be acting out or sexually active to be part of that group or to be called that, right? So I, I'm really strong about using that term because I think that not using it is in a sense, first of all, saying same-sex attraction is actually identifying a person more with their, their sexuality, right? I think LGBT is just frankly what they want to be called, so that's what I'll call them. The question of how to deal with um, uh, you know, the attraction to another sex, you asked me to sort of categorize it. I would say I would certainly distinguish it between stealing because it is an impulse to love. And so I think we can't put those things in the same category. Uh, a person, I believe, are born that way. I think every reputable psychologist and psychiatrist would say that, that people in those situations are born that way. And this is the way that they experience love, which is a lot different than a person who decides to steal. So the first thing is to, to not lump all those things together, to not talk about those, those tendencies and those desires in the same breath even. I mean, when we talk about like stealing or murder and then LGBT people, we are reducing their, their way that they are born to love as a, as, a kind of, as, a, as a kind of violent thing. And I would say that, that they do not experience it that way, and nor does the culture at large experience it that way. I have many people, you know, friends of mine who are, I mean, I'll tell a story. Uh, a couple I saw last night, my friends Mark and Craig in, in Boston. I use this story in the book. Um, Mark and Craig have been together for 20 years. Craig has a serious illness, and Mark's been caring for him for 20 years. Okay, they're, they're, they're a gay couple. Now, presenting what we think about same-sex marriage, right, and the church, is, the church is against that, that is not in any way comparable to stealing. 
right? This is an act of love. And the other thing we need to look at is, you know, how does this affect the community at large? So you see Mark and Craig's love, you know, helping them to flourish and helping people around them to see what love is. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the first thing to do is to accept the psychological and biological fact that people are born this way, right? To understand that this is the way that they are called to love in the deepest part of themselves, right? And that we need to distinguish between those kinds of actions and the other kinds of actions, lying, stealing, murder. Because mm -hmm. even mentioning that in the same breath, I think is really, it causes violence against them. Because then, then that permits society to say that that is just as bad as st stealing. So then, so you would make a distinction then between emotional attraction and sexual attraction, right? It's no. like we're all we're all called to friendship, right? Like we're all called to that, right? Philia, sure. the most important kind of love for the Greeks of the four kinds, right? So LGBT people were taught by the by the Catholic Church are called to the deepest levels of friendship, but like but they are called to resist sexual engagement, and I think the church should be clear about that. The church is very clear about that. Good. I'm glad. I hope it stays clear. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jim, for being with us this evening. Um, I wanted to ask you about a chapter of the book that you didn't get to talk about tonight. Uh, I think it was my favorite about the other side of the bridge for the LGBT community um, and coming toward the church and the chapter on sensitivity. And the two points that you make are sensitivity in the way that we read media. So if there is a news article saying the Vatican has said something homophobic, you know, the Vatican, this may be someone without any real power, right. um, who just the New York Times is calling the Vatican. So a need to be critical readers, which is very difficult with um, the sort of flux of media that we get, um, and the other point that you make is um, sensitivity in tone, that I think there are so many grounds for having a kind of righteous anger about the way that queer people have been treated in the, by the church. Um, and, but a sensitivity in the tone that we respond to moments when there are reasons for righteous anger. Um, and <laughs> I mean, you've had to deal so much with things that have happened since this book came out. So I'm just, I'm wondering um, how you have navigated those two ways of sensitivity of how do we read media as sensitive and critical um, readers uh, and then sensitivity in our own tone for you're such an example of being a prophetic witness on this issue, but with such grace and humility in the way that you speak. Um, so how do you, how do you like channel that righteous anger yeah. with this kind of Yeah, humility? well, I mean, oh, so that's a, that's a big question. So the, the first part of the question is, the, the second part of the book is encouraging the LGBT community to also treat the church with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. So for example, understanding church teaching, right? Um, I wrote an article about that uh, in America. Respecting bishops, I mean, literally respecting them. I mean, actually treating them with dignity and treating them with respect, right? Uh, compassion, understanding the bishops and the kind of complexity of their ministries, right? Um, but also um, sensitivity, as you were saying. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. Um, so the sensitivity, one thing is to understand that when, when the church teaches, it teaches with different levels of authority. So what your priest says on Sunday does not, simply does not have the same level of authority as an encyclical or a council. It just doesn't, right? And that's part of Catholic teaching. That needs to be paid attention to, right? It's not as if you can dismiss it, but we have to understand the different levels of authority, right? So, and, and the, you, the thing I said in my book is that when you look at what the media says about the church, and the, the example I used was Vatican says priests should keep homily state minutes, right? And I thought, what the heck is that? And of course, it turns out it's one bishop in one dicastery who made this comment. That is not the Vatican saying any such thing. And so when the Vatican says something about LGBT people, to just look at what level of authority it comes from. right? So that, that's the basic thing. The tone is, is a little different. The, you know, in, in the first book, I talked about the respectful tone that I think really moves the dialogue ahead. And then based on my experience, and as I said, there's a man in this room whose story I tell in the book, uh, respectful dialogue with bishops, really like listening to them, encountering them, and you know, taking them seriously, listening to, to what to what they have to say. Right? You may meet bishops who have never met an LGBT person before, so to have a kind of compassion with that, you know. 
So that's, however, in the, the second version of this book, this revised, revised and expanded version, I make more room for, for people who, who feel that their only outlet is to protest. I met with a group of LGBT people at that Church of St. Paul the Apostle, and they said something really, you know, I've been challenged a lot by all sorts of people, progressive Catholics, traditional Catholics, left, right, center, conservative, you know, liberal, which is good. You know, you need to listen to people and sort of respond to them and take what they say seriously. And they said to me, which was really challenging, but I had to hear it, you know, Jim, you have access to bishops and archbishops and cardinals. We do not, which is true. Most people can't walk. I'm not going to go walk in and talk to my bishop about this. You just can't. You may not have access. And so they said, for us, we feel that sometimes protest, you know, respectful protest is the only thing left for us. So I made some more room for that in the book. That's our charism. That's a different charism. We're not, we're not priests. We're not religious. We can't just call up the bishop. And a lot of times they've tried and they've had their hands slapped. Now, as for me, um, I think it's, um, well, I'll just say this. It's important to know this. Everything in that book has been approved by my religious superiors, OK? The initial talk at New Ways Ministry that this book is based on was approved by my provincial superior in New York, by the provincial superior in Baltimore, where the talk was given, by the editor of America Magazine, my director of my work, as we call it. Um, it's been endorsed by cardinals and archbishops and bishops. My superior general told me to keep building bridges, right? So this is squarely within the church, OK? So I know that when I'm speaking, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who is in the church. And so I always try to be respectful and charitable. I mean, I, sometimes I fail, right? Sometimes I tweet something out that I shouldn't have tweeted out. But I try to be respectful and listen to people and take them where they are. And um, as for the attacks that I've kind of undergone, um, uh, I think if they're legitimate and reasonable questions, I'll answer them. Right? I mean, there are people who have legitimate questions, right? That are, you know, I'm not, I'm not Jesus. I don't have all the answers, and people, I learn things. Um, but oftentimes they are really kind of homophobic, uh, really kind of hateful sites, websites. And I've been called hom uh, homosexualist, sodomite, pansy, fairy, faggot, heretic, 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 heretic. <laughs> and it's just, you're clapping for that. Someone's clapping for that. So some people agree. Now, it's important to say that, you know, what I am saying is well within the teaching of the church. Okay, and it's, it's hard for some people to accept that. This is well within the teaching of the church. Nonetheless, people say these things. You know, where am I going to stand? Am I going to stand with the crowd that grumbles and the crowd that jeers at Zacchaeus? Am I going to stand with people who, ex who do not want to extend mercy to people? Or am I going to stand with Jesus? I'm standing with Jesus. Even though, you know, it might it might sort of bring me sort of protest and things like that, because I'm a Jesuit. I've been granted a grace, um, and this is not for me, which is that the the attacks don't really bother me anymore. Because I know what I'm doing. I have the support of the Society of Jesus. I have the support of, I mean, I don't want to list all the cardinals and stuff, but you know, I'm well within church teaching. And even though it's it's challenging to people to do this kind of stuff. It's what I'm called to do as a Jesuit, and I wouldn't be able to sleep if I didn't do it. So it's, it's all worth it. I mean, what would be the point of me calling myself a Jesuit if I didn't stand with him? Maybe one more question? Um, I, I yes. fear while, while I was standing here, you almost answered my questions. Already. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But so I was, I was wondering, it seems like this audience here is, is fairly sympathetic to the views you've presented. But as, as you've been telling us, there are other audiences who are less sympathetic. And I was just wondering if you talk a little more about the, the strategy on a practical level, um, your strategy to convince those who are less sympathetic and you know, what we can do as, um, as Catholics in general to challenge some of those. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, the first thing is to treat people with respect and dignity. Everybody, even people that disagree with you, right? Um, the second thing is to, that's the first thing, treat everybody with dignity. The second thing is to listen to them, to really listen to them. 
to say, what is it that's bothering you about this? Or what is it that I can explain more? Right? I mean, to really take, you know, you know, these are good Catholics, right? These are not terrible people. These are good Catholics who are trying their best to be good Catholics and follow the, follow the Gospels as they see, right? So it's not like they're terrible people. Now, there are some, there's a small minority who are homophobic and hateful. That's a very small minority, okay? Um, the other thing is, I'm not really big on convincing, you know, because... Uh, even Jesus was powerless to convince some people. I think part of it is just to proclaim it as you see it, to try to be loving and, and to follow the lights that, that God has given you and not worry that people don't like you. And I think that can be very freeing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was on retreat, and I was praying with the passage of the rejection at Nazareth. Remember that passage where Jesus is rejected by everybody in his hometown, Right? And I remember saying to Jesus in my prayer, well, how were you able to do that? Because you obviously knew that when you stood up, you know, Nazareth was probably not much bigger than this, 200 or 400 people. He would have known everybody in that crowd. And I, I imagine saying to Jesus, how were you able to do that? And I heard in prayer, must everyone like you? You know, and actually at the time I said yes. You know? <laughs> But I realized, like, not everyone's going to like me. And, and in July or August, when all these uh, websites were doing videos of me as a heretic and liar and sodomite and wolf in sheep's clothing and endless tweets and, and videos and emails and protests, and I feel, this is more personal, I feel like I crossed that barrier from, you know, wanting people to like me to realizing that not everyone's going to like me. You know, I'm basically trying to stand with Jesus. I'm doing my best. I may, you know, get some things wrong, but that's where I'm trying to stand. So it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's Jesuit detachment, really. No, it is. No, really, that's what we call it. We call it maybe, I, I don't know if that sounds funny, but that's what we call it. It's Jesuit indifference or detachment. Pope Francis talks about that a lot, the freedom, the freedom to not, you know, really get bothered by these things. You know, Pope Francis is really being mercilessly critiqued these days, and uh, a lot of my friends who know him say it doesn't bother him. So, again, it's, and, and honestly, and maybe this is where a good place to stop, um, uh, sorry to be so personal, why am I doing all this? There's one reason, Jesus, the end. That doesn't mean that I have a lock on how Jesus is or wants us to act, but that's why I'm doing everything. And if in the process I get people who think I'm a heretic, you know, it's still standing with him to embrace that possibility. You know, Jesus himself was called things like this, right? And yet he continued, and, and I'm trying to model myself after him, as we all are. So maybe I would just say this. I would just say thanks to Jen, thanks to the St. Thomas More Center, thanks to Yale. Thank you to all of you who come out. And I really would like to ask you to keep me in your prayers. And can we end with the prayer? Is that okay? So let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Loving God, we thank you for bringing us together under the patronage of St. Thomas More. We thank you for the gift of community, especially here at Yale. Thank you for all the wonderful people who draw us together, like Sister Jen and Father Bob. We ask you to pray for him, too. We ask you to help us be open to our LGBT brothers and sisters. Give us uh, spirits of compassion and wisdom. Help us to treat them with respect, sensitivity, and compassion. And we pray in your name, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Thomas More. St. Ignatius, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. So as
as was mentioned, there are some books that are available for birthday, Christmas, graduation gifts. If you have already purchased your gift, please line up and Father Jim will be out there to sign books. If you have not, then books are for sale near the uh, front desk. Thank you so much for attending tonight. <laughs>